I have the awesome privilege of introducing our speaker for the evening, Dr. Alvin Sanders. See, I, I, I knew this brother before he was doctor. I know, I know his mama, I know his daddy, I know his sister, I know his wife, Carolyn, I know his two kids, Gabby and Hannah, I knew them when they were babies. You know, in everyone's life, there's always people who help you to get to where God has called you to go. You know, we all have, hopefully, if we've been walking with Jesus, we have our pause in our lives, you know, for, our, for, for us being Timothy's. And Alvin has been that to me. I remember once when I was, uh, I finished up college and I had uh, my first job coming out of college in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. And I remember uh, someone said, there's this guy starting this church in the inner city of Cincinnati. They've got this small little core group of people and they're looking for people to be a part of this church. And I said to myself, well, I've never been a part of a, a, a new church before. Let me go ahead and see what they're talking about. And I remember that evening going to the Bible study that they had, and they had about a handful of adults and about 20, 30 kids just running around everywhere. And so at the end of the evening, at the end of the study, I actually started playing with the kids. I love kids, so I started playing with the kids. And the evening, as the evening progressed, I'm playing, and I just started to, to pick one child up, put one down, pick one up, put one down. And as I looked up, there were 10, 20 kids just running in line, running in line. And after a while, of course, my arms started to get tired. And the gentleman who brought the kids on the, on the van had said, you know what, kids, it's time to go. And so as the kids are going through, they're running to the bus. And I remember there was one little girl, about six years old. She, she, she tugged on my pants leg. And she said, ooh, 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 can you pick me up? Because no one picks me up at home. In that year, God called us to plant a church in the over the Rhine area of Cincinnati. Some of us know that area because it was in the news that year because there were some, some race riots. And it was a blessing for us to be able to bring the light of Christ to a community filled with darkness. And to see a local church be able to be in a community that said that we're glad that you're here. And so, Dr. Alvin Sanders, it even feels funny for me to say that. My former pastor, the current director of reconciliation for the Evangelical Free Church, um, has been, has made such an impact on my life. And I, what I want to do is introduce him to some of you and reintroduce him to others. Um, as we go into this time, let me just pray for my brother and, uh, allow him to be able to bless us in the word of God. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We worship you, Lord, for you are good and your mercy endures forever. And God, we thank you for the ministry of reconciliation that you've called us to be as ambassadors of Christ. Lord, you've gathered us here over these past couple days, Lord, because as the body of Christ, Lord, we don't want to just accept the status quo that church just should look the same, God. But we realize, Lord, that you want people from every tribe and nation and tongue to worship you, Lord, together. And so, God, we pray right now, Lord, that for the time that we have to continue in worship and continue in your word, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would bless Alvin, that you would allow him to speak your word in spirit and in truth, Lord. Help us to be able to leave this place being changed, transformed, and renewed in you. And God, help us to be quick to exalt your holy name, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I love Jua. This is my brother from another mother. You was claimed the fame is he retired me from competitive basketball. Because I used to I used to be able to hoop back in the day, you know, about hundred pounds ago, I, I could ball. But one day we went to the Y and he beat me three straight games. So that's it. Ego could take it. But I am so glad to be here today. Um, 
want to give glory and honor to God who's ahead of my life. And I want to thank uh, both Jubilee Church as well as Morningstar for the use of your awesome facilities, Ethnic American Network for issuing me the invitation to come speak to you tonight. This is the last night. I'm the last speaker. So you know what night this is? This is double dose of the Holy Ghost night. <laughs> this, is, this is not time to, it's long, it's been a long conference. Not, no, no, you rest after the conference. <laughs> Tonight, it's time to worship. It, it's time to celebrate the glory of God. Amen? You know, I, I've been sharing with you uh, about, you know, my... My, my ego and how it got humbled by Jewel. I, I had a number of humbling experience. Uh, two months ago, I turned 40. It's like, where did that come from? You know, those, those birthdays with the zeros on the end, they have a way of messing with your head. You know, I remember when I turned 20, I was all concerned about, oh, what does everybody think about me? I found at 40, I don't care what none of y'all think about me. You understand? And I suppose when I get 60, I'm going to realize when nobody's thinking about me at all. But I ain't there yet. But you know what I did on my 40th birthday? I'm a real wild man. I went to the bookstore. <laughs> Just went to the bookstore. And I, and I bought a book. Some of you may have heard this book. It's called uh, Halftime by Bob Buford. In this book, he talks about a principle of going, having success in your entire life. But he says, at some point, you have a crisis of success. And at that point, usually 40, 50-ish, you've got to switch your mindset from trying to achieve success to trying to have significance before you get out of this world. And so he says, you have to have a halftime, like a good football team, you know, they go into halftime and they make their adjustments. If they're behind 10 points, maybe the adjustments that they make, they may end up winning the game or whatnot. But he says, there comes a point in your life where you just have to take some time and, and quit adding everything up, you know, quit checking things off, you know, married, check, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, check, 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 you know, nice house, check. You know, cars, check, dog, cat, check, check. You got to quit keeping score. And you got to say, am all of my success, am I building up significance? And 40 is a good time to start thinking about that. See, let me, let me, let me illustrate to you why it is so important for us to think about whether or not our success is making a significant difference in the world. I want to read to you today a, a real-life obituary of Dolores Aguilar. Dolores Aguilar, uh, she died on August 7th, and this obituary ran August 16th, 2008, in the Vallejo, California Times Herald newspaper. I'm telling you all this because after I read this obituary, you're going to know why. Dolores Aguilar, born in 1929 in New Mexico, left us on August 7, 2008. She will be met in the afterlife by her husband, Raymond, her son, Paul Jr., daughters, Ruby, Beatrice, Virginia, Ramona, and son, Billy. Dolores had no hobbies, made no contributions to society, and rarely shared a kind word or deed in her life. I speak for the majority of her family when I say her presence will not be missed by many, very few tears will be shed, and there will be no lamenting of her passing. Her family will remember Dolores, and amongst ourselves, we will remember her in our own way, which were mostly sad and troubling times throughout the years. We may have had some fond memories of her, and perhaps we will think of those times too. But I truly believe at the end of the day, all of us will really only miss what we never had. A good and kind mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. I hope she is finally at peace with herself. As for the rest of us left behind, I hope this is the beginning of a time of healing and learning to be a family again. There will be no service, no prayers, and no closure for the family she spent a lifetime tearing apart. 
We cannot come together in the end to see to it that her grandchildren and great-grandchildren can say their goodbyes. So I say here for all of us, and this was written in caps, goodbye, mom. Talk about putting your business in the street. Now, I, I've been in ministry for 19 years. I done done many a funeral. But, I mean, wow. That's what you call a legacy without spending a half time. That's what you call somebody who had some sort of definition of success, but that success obviously didn't mean be significant to the people around me. You know, in my pastoral counseling sessions that I've had over the years, no longer in the pastorate, but I've had my share, and I've met many of Dolores Aguilar. On the outside, all of the trappings of success, but in the inside, all messed up. Nice houses, luxury cars, multiple degrees, but they didn't have enough Jesus to be significant. See, I, I, I ain't talking about that pagan world out there. I'm talking about y'all, me, us's, Ebonics from Alabama way, us's. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm here to talk to us tonight. I mean, I've met many of Dolores Aguilar who had a nice bins. Worked 80 hours a week. That's why her family was messed up. Did not take half time to add up what is significant because they're too busy filling out the check boxes of success. Got to make some halftime adjustments, y'all. And I think it's time for the American church to go into halftime and to make some adjustments. Because, saints, in some ways, we have never been so successful. Statistically speaking, we have all the outward trappings of success. We have a lot of butts in the pews. We have beautiful buildings, and we meet in every Sunday. And our budgets, although it's tight right now, the American church has never had as much money than, it is, than right now in history. There has never been a church that has as much money as we do. But beyond the butts and the buildings and the budget, let me bottom line things for you. You see, I spent 19 years in ministry, and now I pastor pastors all over this country. And here's what I see. Overwhelmingly, there's a restlessness in the pews because they sense that they're not significant. And there's another thing that's happening. That even though we have all the outward trappings of success, uh, people are just searching. So most of our churches... What happens is they come in to say, I have a church, and they stay with me for a while, and then they just search for something else, and, and they go to somebody else's church. And, you know, we call that growth. <laughs> Transfer growth. But it ain't kingdom growth. Because the zero-sum game is, if I lose a member and this brother gains a member, the kingdom didn't gain anybody. Somebody needs to give me an amen. I thought I was at Morning Star Baptist Church. I, I thought I left my frozen, chosen evangelical free church for a minute. Hey, am I going to get some talk back to you tonight? It, it's tight, but it's right. You know it is. Saints, the reason we need halftime, because Jesus called us to be fishers of men, not fishing at the aquarium, not hunting at the zoo, not picking low-hanging fruit. Too many ministries are focused on being the best church in the community instead of being the best church for the community. And see, see me, me and Jewel, we went down in the middle of a race ride. Y'all might remember that back at CNN. See, Cincinnati was all on the news in 2001 because there was a shooting death by a white police officer. He shot a young African-American man dead. Now, if it was only one, I suppose the city would have been all right. But it was the 15th killing. 
over a five-year period of the Cincinnati Police Department of a young African-American man. And the community had enough. And against all my seminary training, I said, we got to do something about this. And I got to find some folk crazy enough to do something about this with me because I don't want the low-hanging fruit out in the burbs. Not a slight to you suburban folk, but sometimes I wonder if y'all, how do y'all know the Holy Ghost is there? Everything's so nice and pristine and proper and clean. I, it's like, well, how y'all know the Holy Spirit showed up? I digress. But anyways, <laughs> is there anybody crazy enough to go down with me? It's over the Rhine, which, by the way, study just came out, is the second most dangerous neighborhood in the United States of America. Not in L.A., not in New York City, not in Chicago, but little old Cincinnati. Is somebody crazy enough to go down there with me and see some kingdom growth? Because I don't want to fish in the aquarium. I want to be like Paul. I want to build on something new. When I do something, I want people to notice. And oftentimes, you got to go into a crazy situation for people to notice. We need to take a look at a portrait of a church tonight that they are being challenged to move from trying to be the best church in the community to being the best church for the community. You've heard of this church. It ain't yours, because your church don't have any problems. But this church has problems. Turn, in, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You people don't know, understand that I'm sarcastic here. 1 Corinthians 13. This is a church at Corinth. They had some issues, y'all. There's just no other way to put it. And they had probably more mis issues than the average church. The Apostle Paul, they, they, you know, they were so messed up, Paul had to write two letters to them, you know. I said, these fools ain't get it the first time. And second Corinthians, probably a third Corinthians somewhere out there. But Paul is trying to adjust this situation, see, because these folk are worshiping at this church, and they have forgotten what church is all about. So 1 Corinthians 13 says the following. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. You know, I've heard people exegete this text, and, and in their exegesis, they came to the conclusion that the main point of these verses is to talk about whether the spiritual gifts of tongues has ceased or not. You know, as the, uh, uh, the bishop said the first night, you've been wrong before. I don't think that that is the main point of this chapter. 
Granted, it's true that Paul in chapter 12 and in 14 is instructing the Corinthian church on spiritual gifts. But let me offer to you that what we have here is Paul taking a brief tour, detour from that spiritual gifts instruction defining love. Because it's important that we define what love is, especially in this dead world today. Now more than ever, it's important to talk about love because people think love is everything but what the Bible says it is. Love is what makes your success significant. Our cultures use the word love on everything, uh, you know, sexual intercourse, uh, feelings towards things like sports teams, food, houses, cars. There's even a, a commercial where a man can tear a bill bottle that he loves it, but he can't tell his wife or his girlfriend that he loves her. My nine-year-old, a little sarcastic, don't know where she got it from. She's a little sarcastic. But if you tell her, I love this or I love that, she'll say, well, why don't you marry it? <laughs> you know, and it's a little reminder, don't flippantly throw that word around, Daddy. Love is relevant to the topic of spiritual gifts because what Paul is challenging the Corinthians about is who they really are. At the core, at the end of the day, who are you really? In other words, what is your foundation for practicing such spectacular spiritual gifts? You see, God cares much more about who you are than what you do because you can be the wrong person doing the right thing. But God wants you to be the right person doing the right thing. And see, the, the Corinthians' main problem is they were doing some right things with their spiritual gifts, but for the wrong reasons. Their context was their own self-interest. In other words, they define their success outside the context of love. Therefore, they were ceasing to be significant to their community and began to look like their community more than the gathered body of Jesus Christ. Paul is applying the necessary corrective in saying, no, the context for the use of your spiritual gifts is love of others, not your own selfish interest. Paul's teaching here is that the whole point of you having the spirit and the corresponding spiritual gifts is for you to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Paul says, all right, I get it. You speak in tongues. You get knowledge and wisdom from your prophecies, and you think that success stops there. But at the same time, look at who you are. We know from reading the whole of 1 Corinthians that among the things that the Corinthian church tolerated was illicit sexuality, greed, idolatry, destruction of a fellow church member you see in chapter 8. So Paul say you may be experiencing the outward trappings of success with your spiritual gifts, but be or are not significant because there is no love present among you. You're running around doing what's best for you, not the community. Love does not necessarily move to seek justice for ourselves, but if you truly love in Christ's name, it should drive you to seek justice for others. When you love someone or somebody, it causes you to be selfless and to sacrifice and to serve and to get out there. Really, without love, we're just a bunch of social workers. Ain't nothing wrong with social workers. I married one. But she no. You got to have Jesus with you to make a difference. That's what he means in verse 1 when he first heard him speaking in tongues as a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You see, there was a religious cult that used to walk around Corinth, and they would bang their gongs, and they would clang their cymbals as a symbol of how powerful they were. And Paul's saying, y'all so spiritually arrogant, you're the emperor with no clothes on. You are just like them. You have no power because you have no love. 
Love is not an idea for Paul. If you look in the previous verse in, in chapter 12, verse 31, he says this in the second part of it, and I show you still a more excellent way. Then he starts talking about love. For Paul, the motivating factor for being a Christian is to love Christ and then let it function in your life. Paul in this chapter is arguing if you don't love well, you are missing the whole point. Love serves as the foundation of the spiritual gifts, but it is not itself a spiritual gift. It is what Christianity is all about, no matter what era or ethnicity or culture you find yourself in. It meets our deepest needs. It enables us to live differently from the world and increase our gratitude for the way God works. You see, when the love of Christ is present, there's a new kind of glory. Is that our theme tonight, Greg? Oh, oh, wow, imagine that. A new kind of glory. You want to see glory? You introduce the presence of God in your life. I'm not talking about, you know, some golf clap God. I'm talking about a God that brought you through something. I'm talking about people who understand that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, oh, where should I be? I'm talking about people who have been stuck in the miry clay. Not the clay that you can get out of, but the clay you couldn't get out of. But somehow, some way, God brought you out. I'm talking about those people who understand that type of love. Not some God that begins at 7 a.m. and ends at 745, but a God who's around all day long on the boss with your crazy job. At home with your crazy kids. At church with perhaps maybe even your crazy pastor. But he's crazy for a reason, so you need to listen to him. <laughs> See, we all understand the power of the presence of love. Let me, let me, let me give you an illustration here. It, it's going to fall short. It's an earthly illustration. But I think it gives you a sense of you understand the power of the presence of love. You know, back in the day, one of the things you and I share as well is we went to the same college. I went way before he did. Thanks for the reminder, and I'm 40 again. But I went way before he did, and, and, I, and I stumbled into my wife there. And I say stumble because it truly was a stumbling. See, I, I knew Jesus, but I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention to him. Hey, man, somebody. I guess I'm the only one that's happened to. But, you know, and, and, and I stumbled into this Bible study and met this young lady named Carolyn. Now, you know, I consider myself a little player player, you know? You don't know what that is? Ask somebody. But, you know, I wasn't a big player. You know, I wasn't Hugh Hafner, but, you know, Tupac said I got around, you know. And, and I met Carolyn. Now, back in the day, we ain't had cell phones and all that, you know. So I had me a little black book. You know, I keep my little, you know, my little girl's names in there and you little stars, whatnot, right? Within two weeks of meeting Carolyn, I didn't know where that black book was. So y'all missed that. What I just said is I just had a tremendous life change. I went from trying to date every skirt that was walking down the campus road to after I met Carolyn, I don't know any other girl's names. You know, some girl called me, hey, Alvin, I ain't here. Click. If it ain't her. I guess y'all ain't never been in love. Because when you meet the one, you start rearranging things, don't you? This, this go over here. You know, I, I can't have, oh, I got to clean up. I ain't cleaning my life. I got to clean up. Got to get my hair cut. Got to get me an earring. She find that cute. I got to get me an earring. Because I done met the one. I don't care if mama daddy mad that I got one. She ain't, ain't Carolyn. Get excited when she call. Leap in my spirit. Talk to her all night long about nothing. <laughs> Y'all ever been in love? Have you ever paid attention to when you're in love, how that presence dissipates everything else? And if that's what a human being does... 
My, my, my. What can a God do if you truly fall in love with him? What can a God do when a church truly falls in love with it? Can it start rearranging the community? Can it make a community that was known for drug dealing be known for a place of safety and prosperity? Can it be a place where kids come to the youth group and if they didn't come to your youth group, they'd be on their way to jail, but now they're on their way to Yale? Can, can it be that type of place? Can it be a type of place where folk who are shacking up and doing all kinds of stuff just fall under the conviction of the Spirit and say, Pastor, marry me right now? Can it be that type of place? Can it even be a place that doesn't put his hope, I'm getting ready to get in trouble, put his hope in political parties? Because I got to tell the white folk Obama ain't the Antichrist. I got to tell the black folk Obama ain't the Messiah. Jesus is your president. Can it be the type of place that rises above the politics of its situation and is a success anyhow? Or is our eschatology tied to economic structures and political structures? Folks falling out because they person didn't get elected. Are you out your mind? Who would Jesus vote for? Who do you, what makes you think Jesus would vote? <laughs> the earth is his footstool. What he vote for? I digress again. Sorry, y'all. But I, I just think that if we can get the American church to take a halftime and start to sort some things out, start to make some adjustments. Y'all heard Soon Chan Ross' speech yesterday. You better make some adjustments. There's a paradigm shift that's already here, and you better make some adjustments. Can you go into halftime? Put your success tabulations away just long enough to see if you're actually being significant. That if you're actually ushering in the presence of God. Because this is from somebody who has all kinds of degrees, but the degrees are not the source of my success. The source of my success is the presence of God in my life. Now, I wish I had learned that before I got all them degrees and spent all that money, but nevertheless... Can you convince yourself that the presence of God being in your life and giving you a white-hot faith is what will cause the new glory of God to show up in your home and in your community? You forget that Matthew 22, 37 through 40, and the Good Samaritan story in Luke 10, 25 through 37, Jesus is very clear. At the end of the day, this thing's all about loving God with all your heart and soul and mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself. And everything else builds on that. Can we truly believe that, saints of God? I'm going to tell you right now, with the paradigm shift that has come, and with the changes that we're going to have to make to be significant, if you don't believe that, you're in trouble. And God is going to bring the community of these nations Around us, he's going to change the demographics in such a way that you are going to have to believe that in order to be considered an authentic church of God. People don't know what an authentic church of God looks like. People don't know what an authentic Christian looks like because I got all these images telling them what a Christian looks like. And then there's something that you got to do called being incarnational. Somebody did it before. His name was Jesus. And you got to go and you got to live amongst them and you have to show them what it means to be a Christian because if you don't show them, Romans Road is not working anymore. Four Spiritual Laws is not working anymore. And any of those canned programs that you have and worked in the past will not work anymore because this generation from Missouri, show me, from the show me state, that's the only thing that they respect. That's the only thing that they honor. I'm not someone who just preaches this. I live this. I can go to the downtown Y and sit in a sauna with four or five gay guys and tell them about Jesus without condemning them, 
without demonizing them and not participating in what they do. That's important to note. They respect me. They honor me. They don't agree with me, but they listen. And I know that if they keep listening, I got a stick of dynamite for them called the Holy Spirit. And one day when they lay in their bed and they're feeling mighty low and Easter stuff starts to come around and Christmas music starts to play, they say, maybe I'll go visit that old crazy pastor who started the church around the way. He ain't there no more, but you know what? Jesus might be. New glory, Shekinah glory, the kind of glory that causes people to bow their knees. You got to work for it, saints. I'll tell you one more present story. I'm going to wrap it up, maybe. It is double dose of the Holy Ghost tonight, isn't it? I just want to tell you about my life story. Can I be a little bit open here? Not in the in micro sense, but the broad sense, because I, I, I think that you can trace the glory of God with this story I'm about to tell you. Because I think that this is how God works. See, the history of my family, my family's from Alabama. Mom's from Eufaula, dad's from Anniston. Grew up in Jim Crow law, saw the worst that America could offer racially. Grandfather was a bootlegger. Some of y'all probably don't even know what that is. You don't Google it. <laughs> but he was doing something illegal. Dad grew up hard. My dad is hardcore, y'all. Some of y'all say, you, you, you don't know a hard man until you know my daddy. You know how hard my daddy was? He told me Vietnam saved him. He shoot people legally. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I ain't the, you know, y'all got some narratives like this. And grew up in a household in which when I went off to college, I got one instruction. Don't bring home no white girls. That was it. Not study hard. Not we proud of you. But you got to remember, my parents came from Jim Crow, Alabama. You look at a white girl, it could be your neck. Ties may have changed, but they said, don't bring home no white girls. The only instruction. And so I, I had, my parents did well. You know, they, they kind of knew Jesus, not a whole lot. Had some trauma in my life, was sexually abused. Five, six years old. So, I struggled through life. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of historical history. I can remember cutting the grass and kids in my neighborhood saying, hey, Alvin, we're going to go rob a liquor store. You want to come with us? No, I'm going to keep cutting the grass. That's the type of neighborhood I grew up in. Okay? Maneuver through all of that. Then I meet Jesus seriously at 20, 20 years ago. I knew about him, but I met him for real 20 years ago, okay? Now, you, you got all that historical narrative. You, you got the racism. You got the abuse. You got all that stuff. Now, look at what I'm doing now. I'm executive director of reconciliation for the Evangelical Free Church of America. Nor Scandinavian, Swedish, Norwegian white folk. You know, Jim Crow, Alabama South, don't bring home no white girls. Are y'all following this? Don't bring home no white girls. Executive Director of Reconciliation for an all-white denomination. Messed up sexually from the sexual abuse, which is why I was a player player. One wife. 16 years, two beautiful daughters. How does that happen? How does that happen? What can wash away my sins? 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the what? That does what? And then the presence of God shows up. And God says, even though you were sexually abused, and even though you was a player player, I'll make you have a strong marriage. I'll let you love one woman. And even though your parents had a lot of historical stuff done to you, I'm going to give your family a little bit of reparations. And now you get the boss, 400,000 white folk around the country. <laughs> and don't think I don't know that. <laughs> God can flip the script, y'all. God can flip the script. God can flip the script. You can be on your way to a devil's hell. Where's the B3 guy? No, no, we, we got to go home. Uh, you can be on your way. Let me calm down. You can be on your way to a devil's hell. You could, you, could, you could be so lost that you don't know the road to find your way out wherever you done landed. As a church, your church can be on a deathbed. It could be in a near-death experience. Your community could be on its deathbed, and people could have written it off. And what I say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is that it needs to be that way in order for God to show up in all his power and all his glory and all his majesty to bring glory into the situation so that people can understand and know that this is the only way. The reason that it is only this way is because I am here. The reason Alvin Sanders stands before you here today and not in a jail cell is because God is here. The reason that you are here and listen to all these messages is not so that you can feed yourself and go back fat and happy. It's so that you can do something with it and show people that you are here with God. That is the new glory. The glory is finding Jesus and getting so in love with him that the stuff around you has to change. It has no choice. I look at Isaiah 6. How can you say you have been in the presence of God and come out unchanged? It's impossible. That's the new glory. It's not this building. The new glory is your life. The new glory is being the anti Dolores Aguilar. Instead of being someone who causes discord and trials and tribulations when you show up on the scene, the scene is so chaotic that when you show up, it orders itself. That is the new glory. Money's nice. Buildings are great. But it's you that matters. It's you that matters. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for new glory. We thank you that without your spirit, there is nothing that we can do. God, I thank you for my life. I thank you for all the lies that are represented here. Because if we got here and compared stories, none of us should be here. But you showed up, God. You showed up, God. And we ask that you continue to do so. Lord, we're all actors in this grand narrative called life. Whisper the cues as to where we should go and what roles we should play for expanding your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.